also we examined the model prayer that Jesus left us. Remember the disciples, uh, his disciples said to him, hey look, John's disciples have a prayer. Well, teach us to pray. And uh, Jesus taught them to pray, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we know that uh, as the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, etc. And it's not intended to be the prayer. It is not the prayer. It is a model prayer. It is a model, more accurately, it is a model of how we are to pray. There is adoration. There is petition. Uh, there is intercession. And there is thanksgiving. A reliance on God. All in that model prayer. Tonight we will continue with one more look at some text in this section that I call an invitation to pray. In Jesus our example. In particular I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 5 and verse, 40, and verse 44. Matthew chapter 5. This would be a part of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 and verses and verse 44. I'm sorry. Not, not verse is, but verse 44. <clears throat> I'll read it to you because unless someone is entered into the chat area, it won't allow me to post the text. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Very interesting. Jesus here is saying, in a prayer, or he's saying to people, I want you to love your enemies, and then I want you to pray for them. Imagine that. Pray for your enemies. Stay with Matthew. The next text is Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, excuse me, and uh, verses 7 to 11. Matthew 7, verses 7 to 11. It's another example that Jesus lives, gives us. Uh, you will recognize this as something we like to call the golden rule. Here it is, verse 7 of Matthew 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or, what man is there among you? This is another way of expressing it that Jesus gave. Or, this is, this is verse 9. What man is there among you who has a son, or when, I should say, when his son asks for a loaf, like bread, gives him a stone or if he asks for a fish he will not give him a snake will he if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him I promise that God the Father will give to us what is good the next one in Matthew, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 38. These are all examples under this section of an invitation to prayer. Matthew 9 and verse 38. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Jesus is saying, I want you to pray that the God of heaven, the Lord of the harvest, will send out workers. In other words, that there will be those who are willing to take up the gospel commission. Do you remember the gospel commission? It was It's found in Matthew chapter 28 and verses 19 and 20. Go ye into all the world and uh, preach the gospel. Make disciples. Um, 
tell them, teach them everything that Jesus has taught you and, uh, and, and, and lead them to baptism. And that was Jesus' commission. And so he's saying here in Matthew 9 in verse 38 that pray to God that he will send out workers, those who are willing to labor for souls. Remember he said to the disciples one time, I'm, I'm going to make you, don't worry about fishing for fish, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Hmm. Jesus in that statement indicates that there's some method there's some knowledge to be had in fulfilling the commission of spreading the gospel. All right. Next, Matthew 26 and verse 41. These are all examples of what Jesus suggested in his and in, in, in had us pray for. He calls for us to pray, and he's saying these are the things that we ought to pray for. Okay. One, we ought to pray for our enemies. <laughs> Two, whatever we ask for, if we, 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 he's talking about being persistent. Ask and knock. Whatever you ask for will be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be opened unto you. Talking about what the Father would do. Then he talks about how the, the Father longs, God longs to answer our prayer in the affirmative. And he used the example of an earthly father with his children. When your kids ask, and those of you who celebrate Christmas and have young kids or grandkids, you know, or have siblings, you know that uh, people want certain things. Maybe they've even asked you for certain things. And even in these hard times, you're thinking of ways uh, to, to, to provide the gift, maybe not all of them, but at least some of them, to those who you love. And Jesus said, our Father in heaven even wants to do more, wants to, to, to answer our request even more than an earthly parent does. And therefore, he wouldn't give us something evil or something bad when we ask for something. Now, we're looking at uh, <coughs> Matthew uh, chapter 26 and verse 40, 41 for the next thing that he tells us to pray for. Matthew 26 and verse 41. There's the things that we are to pray for keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak now this is hitting really close isn't it it's telling us that we might desire to do what is right what and and right is being defined as pleasing to god okay there's a text in scripture that says there's a way that seems right to a man and the end thereof is death. So because it feels right humanly, and you ever hear people say if it feels good, it is good and you ought to get it. Well, that is not biblical. In the Bible it says that we have to watch out for temptations. Hmm. How do we how do, why would we have to watch out for being tempted? And the reason it is, the reason given is that our spirit, our desire inside, our thoughts, in our mind, is to do what's right. But often, we are tempted to do what is wrong. Because we were born sinful, and our natural inclination is sinful. And so, it, it, it put it another way, sometimes we talk about a knee-jerk reaction. You ever hear people say that? My knee-jerk reaction was, you know, somebody cuts you off in traffic, your knee-jerk reaction is maybe some expletives or at minimum 
that that person, that the police would be there and see that person's infraction and, and stop them and give them a ticket, you know. Or at least you want to pump your fist and let them know you're angry. Maybe cut them off. That's our natural inclination. And Jesus says, watch out, watch out for that kind of temptation. Because who tempts us? Who's the tempter? Satan. Satan tempts us to rely on our inclination to respond. But God calls us to at all times respond how? in love. Isn't it in this passage of examples that it says, pray for your enemies. Hmm. Those that despitefully use you. So that guy that cut you off in the traffic, you might want to pray for him. Let's look at one more text in, in the line of things that we are to pray for. Luke chapter 18. <clears throat> in verse 1 Luke 18 verse 1 this was a parable now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart Jesus through a parable was teaching that we should pray at all times and not lose heart. Wonder why he say and not lose heart. Hmm. It must mean I don't know what you think, but let me know. That says to me that there are times when it seems like there's no response to our prayer. That's what it seems like to me. And then we're supposed to continually pray and not lose heart. Don't feel like our prayers are not being answered. Um, don't rely on our feelings when it comes to prayer. But this text says that we ought to pray at all times and not to lose heart. One more, okay? <laughs> I get excited about this sometimes. Luke, again, we'll stay with Luke. Luke chapter 21 and verse 36. Luke 21, 36. And then I'll move on. Chapter 21 and verse 36. Here we are. These are things that we should pray for. But keep on alert at all times praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. What was the context of that statement that Jesus made? This is Jesus speaking, and he's speaking to whom? His disciples, his followers. That they be able to escape these things. What was that? Well, it would be attacked by the evil one, and this was leading up to his crucifixion. And that you be able to stand before the Son of Man. All the temptations that we face, that we'll be able to withstand them in the help that we receive from God, or because of the help that we receive from God, because we've asked for his help. Remember that text back in Matthew that said, Ask and it will be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it will be open unto you. That's about praying. Persistence in prayer for the things that God desires to give us. All right. What about God's responses? It's fair for us to begin to look at that. How does God respond to our prayers? Well, in the prayers that uh, Jesus, or the things that Jesus said we ought to pray for, some of them, including this last one in Luke 21, 36, the parable suggests that uh, we're going to have a, a, an answer to our prayer in the affirmative. Is that always the case? Has there ever been a time in Scripture where God didn't even answer the prayer. It isn't like he said yes or no, but he didn't answer. 
Is that possible? What do you say? Are there, are there times when God does not answer the prayer? You know, I gave my testimony at the outset about how God answered my prayer for for healing. You know, I'm, I'm still in the process of healing on this recent cold, and now that I know that I have asthma, and I'm, 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 I, now that I found that out, it has meant a considerable difference. <clears throat> so that was an affirmative answer to prayer. Are there times where God says nothing? Does not answer prayer. 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 6. 1 Samuel 28 verse 6. You there? I'm reading. When Saul, first king of Israel, inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim, that's a capital U-R-I-M, or by prophets. Uh, what was the occasion? You know, uh, Israel's first king knew that God... Uh, was the reason and the force behind their victories even at war and he decided that they needed to go to battle against one of their enemies Philistines and uh, prepared for battle and he needed to get confirmation that God was leading in this plan and uh, he was told by God's prophet Samuel what is a prophet? God's messenger Okay, write that down prophet equals God's messenger or prophet equals messenger and so God had stipulated that only the priest were to offer sacrifices and Saul takes it on himself to offer a sacrifice because Samuel, the prophet, the priest, took too long to come. And people were deserting. And Saul got nervous about his military and his ability to keep the army together. And so he decided he would just offer the sacrifice because maybe Samuel wasn't going to show up. And right after he did, Samuel shows up and says, what have you done? what have you done and it's so often the case when we're wrong we blame someone else Saul blamed him Samuel but the Lord did not answer him either by dreams didn't give him a dream or a vision and by Urim capital U-R-I-M the high priest wore a Urim there was a Urim and a Thummim two stones that were on a breastplate and the Urim was to indicate an affirmative answer. It would light up from the presence of God. God would answer yes through the priest. So he wouldn't communicate to Saul that way or by prophets, which I said was a messenger. He didn't have a message from Samuel to Saul in this regard. No answer. Very interesting. I have another one. It's in the it's in it's found in Psalms eighteen and verse forty one. Psalm eighteen and verse forty one. I'm taking time to give you the context of these scriptures uh, because the, the scripture is very. I, I just pointed to the to the to to the point that I wanted to illustrate, which is no answer from God not a no answer but answer absent God does not answer okay I'm reading verse 41 of chapter 18 in the Psalms they cried for help but there was none to save even to the Lord but he did not answer 
Wow. Context. David is talking about the victory that he got over his enemies and that his enemies pursued him, even called on God for help to get David. God didn't answer them. So there are times when God doesn't answer. What kind of times are those? Hmm? It happens when persons make decisions against God. But then they realize in their distress that they need God. Samuel, I mean Saul, makes a decision to sacrifice which he knew was against God's expressed explicit direction that the sacrificing was to be done by the priest and there was a priest in root Samuel and he wouldn't wait he thought it was too long and so he took matters into his own hand and so he went against God and God didn't answer him and said didn't answer him by dream or by Urim or by prophet Right? 1 Samuel 26. No, 28, verse 6. Second, <clears throat> the example was of David fleeing from his enemies who were in hot pursuit and wanted to destroy him, kill him. And he was God's anointed. God had Samuel to anoint him the next king. Perhaps this was even some of Saul's people out to get him. And so they petitioned God, help us get David. And God does not answer because they were going against God's will. All right. So when, do, when, when does God not answer? This is important. When we go against him and then turn around and say, whoops, we can't do this. We need help. Let's pray. God doesn't answer. At least those are the two examples in Scripture. Okay, next. How about where God does not grant a request? Are there times? Back to Scripture back to scripture Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 26 Deuteronomy it's the fourth book of the Bible fifth book of the Bible right and chapter 20 uh, chapter 3 and verse 26 Deuteronomy 326 I'll read But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. And the Lord said to me, Enough! Speak to me no more on this matter. What was going on? Who's he talking to? Deuteronomy. God's talking to Moses. Moses is asking God to about entering into the promised land there on the eastern side of the Jordan River and the promised land is on the other side of the river and God tells Moses don't even talk to me anymore about this the answer is no No, you will not get to go into the promised land. Those of you who are students will know and remember um, that, that Moses had sinned um, at uh, a particular point where God told him people needed water, they were in the desert, God told him to speak to a rock, 
and water would come out and he hit the rock and in anger said must we myself and Aaron get you guys water and that was an offense to God because it was God who provided the water out of a rock not Moses and for that sin he was not permitted to go into the promised land all those years of leadership all those years even of intercession uh, for the people that he led God's chosen people um, did not mean that he was permitted to enter the promised land another example in which God says no was in Numbers chapter 20 verses 1 to 13 uh, it, it, it's further uh, Aaron who was complicit in the same um, in the same uh, sin with that rock incident was also laid to rest did not get to go into the promised land uh, a little earlier um, in Numbers Miriam also in chapter 20 Miriam is buried so that these two brothers and sister all died short of the promised land something that God said nope you're not going to get in so it was a no to their, their petition I would add a note an important note for Moses God gives him more than he hoped for. Of course he confessed his sin and repented. He still died. But then in Jude, the book of Jude, the next to the last book of the Bible, and verse 9, there's only one chapter in Jude, but if you're listening, Jude 1 and verse 9, also in Matthew uh, verses uh, Matthew chapter 17 verses 1 to 3 it lets us know that Moses was taken resurrected and taken to heaven and you remember in the Matthew account chapter 7 we know it as the transfiguration where just before his death Jesus takes Peter James and John they go up on this mountain and there's light a heavenly presence and Moses and Elijah come from heaven to encourage Jesus as he is close to the time of his sacrifice at Calvary how did Moses get there if in fact he died before he went into the promised land Jude tells us that Jesus the person he comes to encourage takes him to heaven hallelujah answered prayer by God is better than anything that this life can offer let's keep going because now I want to talk about answered prayers there are many cases in scripture that show that God is not only listening to prayers but he answers them accordingly and <clears throat> let's give some example Jesus promises to answer his prayer on these conditions Matthew chapter 18 and verse 19 Matthew 18 verse 19 you with me Again, if you want to, um, if you want to, and you enter the chat area, you, it'll, it'll allow you to chat with me by text and me with you, and it also allow me to post some of these texts that I'm reading. Um, I can't post unless someone goes into that chat area. You don't have to. Um, we can continue this way, but if you want to dialogue back and forth via chat, you'd have to do that. Okay? Here we go. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 19 and this is about one of Jesus' promises in terms of answered prayer again I say to you that if two or three no uh, 
that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it will be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. So Jesus promises an affirmative answer. How? If two agree here on earth. Who's he talking to? His disciples or followers. All right, let's go further. Matthew 21 and verse 22. Matthew 21 and verse 22. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Um, this will allow me to post this um, because you're in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22 I'm fetching it now and I will post it and then we can uh, we can all read it together here we are and, and all things you ask in prayer believing you will receive wow that seems like just carte blanche you can just if you if you ask it and you believe it, you'll receive it. That's what that seems to be saying. All right. John chapter 14 verses 13 and 14. Let me fetch it and then I'll read it. John chapter 13. Right? And no, chapter 14, I'm sorry. Chapter 14 keep me straight now verses 13 and 14 John chapter 14 verses 13 and 14 again answered prayer is what we're talking about examples this is Jesus's promises to answer prayer if here we go what <clears throat> again whatever you ask in my name that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is what Jesus is saying to his followers. Stay with me in John. John chapter 15, verses 7 and verse 16. John 15, verses 7 and and 16. And I'm gonna I'm gonna add verse 10. I like verse 10 as well. So I'm I'm gonna add that one. Hold on. We'll do it uh, one at a time here, and then I'll then I'll read them to you. I'm fetching it. John chapter 15, verses 7, 10, and 16. That's seven. Bear with me. I'm going to the next verse. And then 10. And then verse 16. Here we are. <clears throat> if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. If you keep my commandments, this is verse 10, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give you. Now, this bears commentary. Remember, we've been reading these texts in Matthew that said, whatever you ask, I will give. I will do for you. I'll answer you in the affirmative. Whatever two of you agree upon, my Father will make sure you get that. What Jesus is talking about is qualified. It's not unqualified. We can't, we've already discovered that we get a no answer or no answer whatsoever when we go against God's will. This text proves the point. John chapter 15 verse 7 
says, look, let's read it again. If you abide in me and my words in you, and whatever you ask, it'll be done. And in verse 10, tells you what abide means. If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love. In other words, you got to be a commandment keeper. They didn't say keep some of them. They said keep the commandments. You got to keep all of them. Okay? And then you're abiding in God's love. If you're abiding in God by keeping, by obedience to him. You got that? All right. And then verse 16 says, you didn't choose me. In other words, you didn't choose God. God chose you. And he appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. In John chapter 15, you find the story of the vine dresser um, and the vine. Remember the branches that did not bear fruit were cut off and burned. They were destroyed. But those that were bearing fruit were pruned, clipped. Why? So that they would bear more fruit. <laughs> Is there a difference between the feeling that you receive in discipline and in being pruned? Is there a difference in how you feel? There can be pain involved discomfort at minimum but what this the text that I'm talking about in John 15 is suggesting is that those who bear fruit meaning fruit bearing has to do with what fulfilling the gospel commission witnessing and having others follow Christ as a result of your witnessing you introduce them, the Holy Spirit convicts them, and they become followers too, and then do the same thing. And as a result, you're said to be bearing fruit. And what John 15 suggests is that those who bear fruit get pruned. You know that beautiful rose bush out in front of your house? What happens? They bloom, and then you prune it. Why? You'll get even bigger, better, and more blossoms next time around. Pruning. That's a different topic. But with respect to answered prayer and God's pr Jesus' promises to answer prayer, this is one. And that's why I inserted... At first I didn't have verse 10 in there, but I thought that that was important so that we would know what it means to abide in Christ, to abide in God. Those who abide will have their desires answered. John chapter 16, and verse 23, and then we'll move on. John chapter 16 in verse 23. I'll fetch it. It's also another promise that Jesus makes about prayer. I hope you're writing it down so you keep, keep a track of this. In that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Again, Jesus says that in our prayers, we're to call his name, his name dropping. When we, when we have an audience with the Father, which is our privilege to have because of Jesus' sacrificial death, uh, Paul says we can come before the throne of God boldly. We don't have to be afraid because Jesus has paid the penalty for our sins and then Jesus is saying when you're up there at the throne and you're talking to my father mention my name and he will give you 
what you ask for. Anything you ask for, he will give. As long as you ask for it in my name, in the name of Jesus, my Father will give it to you. Our Father will give it to you. Isn't that beautiful, those promises? Beautiful promises. Perhaps one of the most often pray, prayed prayers hope, you, hope I said that right one of the things we pray for most often is for physical healing when we're sick when we're ill when we're diseased we ask for healing someone comes home from the doctor and has a diagnosis that doesn't sound very good the prognosis is not good we call on believers to pray for us. Remember at work recently one of my supervisors had such a request. A loved one had been diagnosed with a scary disease and she asked for prayer. And uh, I promised and did pray with her. In fact on the spot and continued even in my own private prayers at home. And I, I remember the excitement that uh, she greeted me with a couple of days later. And all she could say was, whatever you did, keep doing it because things are looking better. Answered prayer for illness. Read with me James chapter 5 in verses 17 and 18. James chapter 5 and verses 17 and 18. I'll fetch it. Here we go. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it didn't rain on earth for three years and six months. How long? Three and a half years, no rain. Then he prayed again, verse 18, and the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. Answered prayer. Um, that wasn't the one I wanted for sickness is it it has nothing to do with sickness <laughs> but since I did it I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it and that is just another example of God answering prayer you remember the story of Elijah he's up on Mount Carmel Israel had apostatized they had begun to begun to serve um, an idol named Baal or Baal B double A L B A A L and the prophet of the Almighty God was just sick and he takes it he, he takes action and it ends up with this contest and one of the things that he prays for so that people would know that the God of heaven the only true God um, and by the way uh, Baal or Baal if you want to say was the God of fertility and so Elijah prays to the God of heaven that he would shut up the sky and not permit rain to come. And you can just imagine the famine that ensued because it didn't rain not just for a week or a month or two months or a season. It didn't rain for three and a half years. There was no doubt sickness and death, not to mention not a variety of food. And at the end of that season, when it was clear on the minds of everyone that the God of heaven was in charge, Elijah prays again, and this time that the Lord would send back the rain, and it pours, and fertility of the land returns. Answer prayer. But let me go now, still with James, the book of James, and this I'm still in James, I'm still in, in chapter 5, but some earlier verses 
to talk about prayers for the sick. James chapter 5 verses 13 through 16. I'm fetching it. I got so excited I went to my next one instead of the one I wanted to go to. <clears throat> so bear with me. Here we go. A week ago when I got this excited, you know, I, I, would, uh, I would lose my breath. That's correct. Thank you so much for, for putting it up there. B-A-A-L. That was very helpful. Thank you. And here's the text. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He sings, he's to sing praises. Is anyone, anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he if and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. Hi Melissa, how are you? The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The point of this though was that James is first talking about those who are sick. And those who are sick, it says what? Call the elders of the church, let them pray for you, anoint you with oil, Okay, and what will happen? Huh? What happens when that's done? He says, and the prayer, is verse 15, offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And I like this other part. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Imagine that. Sounds a lot like uh, 1 John 1 9, doesn't it? First John 1 9, what does that say? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and then what? And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is our our knee-jerk reactions that are sinful takes that away takes it away wow so here you, you remember there were times where Jesus healed and he would say your sins are forgiven you and now this begins to make a little bit more sense why James linked these two things together and by the way, who's James? What was his relationship to Jesus here on earth besides being a follower, a disciple? This is not James, the brother of John, the sons of Zebedee. No. This is James, Jesus' younger brother. The epistle of James is written by Jesus' younger brother. And he's saying, look here. If you pray and you believe, you call on the church elders to come and pray for you, intercede for you, anoint you with oil, you'll be healed and your sins will be forgiven. Very similar to what we're promised in 1 John 1 9. Another answered prayer, how about Daniel? We know that story, right? Daniel chapter 2 verses 16 to 23 is the story of what? Daniel has a, has a dream. The king, actually the king, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And uh, he sees this image on the plains of Dura. And 
Babylon, and um, he's confused by it and wants to know the meaning of it. And uh, he calls on all of the smartest individuals in his kingdom, and they didn't have the answer. And he gets angry and says, "Look, I tell you what. If you don't, if you don't give me the answer to my dream, because I can't even remember the dream, I'll kill you. I'll have you put to death, all of you." And uh, one of them said, "You know what? We can't do this, but I know somebody who can." And that's Daniel. And so Daniel prays. He says, "Lord, he, in fact, he doesn't pray alone." He goes and gets a Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, his companions. And by the way, these guys were captives, taken as captives in war. And uh, but they pray. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew the chapter five and verse forty-four, you're supposed to pray for your enemies. And so he. Daniel prays for the revelation and God gives it, answers the prayer and gives him the revelation to tell the king what it was, what the meaning of his dream was all about. God does hear and answer prayers. Whether they're the promises that Jesus gives us about answering, answering our prayers if we abide in him and we talked about what abiding in him was whether you're sick and you get the you get believers in particular the elders to come and pray and anoint you with oil God will raise you up and forgive your sins whether like Elijah you're standing for the truth and you ask God to establish himself in the eyes of the onlookers he'll answer your prayer as he did for Elijah where it didn't rain that was his request for three and a half years and there's something else I like you to learn about Elijah and I'll say it here we'll talk about it again later on be specific in your prayers don't say hey dear God make everything all right let God know what it is you need you do that with a friend right We're to pray to God as to a friend. Right? It's the conversation that we're talking about. And then the example of Daniel. When we know that the answer has to come from on high. There's no human way of knowing what's going to happen. And we petition the God of heaven. He gives us answers to our prayers well I thought I'd end with some recommendations well before we end let's just talk about some effective prayers recommendations for effective prayer uh, the first time I tried to present this topic this is where I ended and we had to redo it because there was some technical difficulty for several people but there were six things that are recommended for effective prayers prayers are effective when these conditions exist number one you call upon the name of the Lord Luke chapter 11 verses 19 I'm sure, not 19, verses 9 to 13. Luke chapter 11, verses 9 to 13. These, what did I say these were? These are recommendations for effective prayers. Call on the name of the Lord. <clears throat> That's a good point, Melissa. Um, we we actually did cover that earlier, and and uh, we gave some examples 
that uh, uh, there was a time where God is silent. And uh, the examples that we gave were First Samuel, uh, what was it, chapter 28 and verse 6. It was the case of Saul, who, remember, he made a petition of God with respect to the Philistines, and God didn't answer him. It says that he didn't answer him with dreams, or by the Urim, or by a prophet. Why? Why wasn't that prayer answered? Because he d was directly disobedient to God. And God didn't even answer him. No yes, no no, I won't give it to you. He just didn't answer. The second example for prayers that are not answered by God is in Psalms, uh, chapter 18 and verse 41. The context was enemies of David hunting him down to try to kill him. And they couldn't find him, so they pray to God and say, Dear God, help us to get David and kill him. And the text says that God didn't answer them. I'll read it for you. Psalm chapter 18 in verse, um, I think it's a, a verse 6, I think. Um, hold on, bear with me. Let me make sure. Psalm 18, no, verse 41. Psalms 18 and verse 41. And it reads, well, well I'll, let me post it. They cried for help, but there was none to save, even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. And again, the reason that God did not answer them was what? Because people made decisions against God, but then they realized in their distress that they needed God to work it out. Now, there are times that God does not grant a request, which is different than ignoring them. Okay, Sometimes God ignores prayer. Sometimes we feel that God is ignored because we haven't got the answer. God, I need the rent money. The rent is due on Friday. Get me the money. Okay, And Friday morning comes, and we haven't got the money. And we could conclude that God has just ignored our prayer. Oftentimes that's how we feel. If we don't get what we want, we think that we're being ignored. Now think of it as being a child and asking for a gift. Mom, can I have? Dad, will you buy me? And um, you don't get it. you are tempted to say, you know what? These guys are ignoring me. They're not even responding to my request. But sometimes, sometimes, our answer is not immediate. But there is an answer nevertheless. And <clears throat> We'll talk about that in a little bit because I want you to understand that because you have not seen an answer does not mean you will not get an answer or it does not mean that you have not been answered. So the second type of response that God gives, first response is he ignores, doesn't answer. Second response is he says no. And we used as example, uh, Melissa, uh, Moses. Remember, Moses asked God to, 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 to let him go into the promised land. He was sorry that he had struck the rock. And more importantly, it wasn't striking the rock that, 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 that God laid him to rest or said that he had to die for. 
but that it or was a sin. The sin was that when he struck the rock, he said, we, meaning himself and Aaron, had to get the water out of the rock for the people. And because God had had a problem with his people, thinking that, who thought that Moses was the 